Hi, I'm Andy Parr, and you're watching The Gadget Guru. Well, this is part two of a series, and in case you missed part one, just click right down here, or here's the link. Now, here's what this is about. As you can see behind me, this is the 2014 Prevo. It's a marathon coach. Now, basically, as I announced, this is my coach, and I don't know a whole lot about Prevos. And I brought in an expert, his name's Gil Johnson. Now in part one, we went all the way down this coach and Gil gave us a lot of good tips and tricks, whether you're a seasoned professional and you know what you're doing here, or whether you're a newbie. Now as we come back to part two, we're gonna pick up where we left off. And that's gonna be right over here. And we're gonna take inside a look of the compartments. And these are the things that move that I really need to learn more about. So stay tuned, because that starts right now on The Gadget Guru. Okay, as promised, this is Gil Johnson. Now, Gil's been kind enough to work with me, and he'll work with you too. All you gotta do is contact him to help me get oriented and acclimated to my new coach. In fact, I've only had this a few days at this point. I don't know when this is gonna be posted, but there's a lot to learn. You know, I already have a 1957 flexible Starliner, and let me tell you, you know, while that thing is a pleasure to drive and the systems work well, these systems are quite more sophisticated. There's Simply stated, there's a lot more going on. And Gil's come in, and while we've been working with the folks at Marathon, you know, going through a couple of days of orientation, Gil's taken this up quite a few notches. And, you know, I really appreciate what he's been doing. Now, Gil, first of all, hello, and thank you for staying around for part two. Congratulations on your purchase. I tell you what, right. she's a beauty, isn't she? She is. One day we'll do a video on the inside, but we're still getting her set up. Okay, opening this up, what are we looking at? Well, we finally made it to the back end of the one side of the coach, and this is our entry into the engine bay. It's a door, it's got stuff behind it, but frankly, there's very little for our owner to have to worry about here. See, you know, that's one thing we were talking about. You know, when, as you were there, we're with Dan and some others from Marathon. You know, what I'm trying to focus on right now, like any new owner per, probably would want to focus on, what are the things that I need to do? What do I need to check regularly? Whether it's once a day before the trip, at the end of the trip, you know, and I guess a few of those things have to do with the backside. Is that correct? Oh, sure. Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, everything in this backside makes you go down the road. So. Okay. So in in this compartment here, and it'll on the Prevo side, we've got chassis batteries below. Again, okay. there's nothing. And that's down here. These, correct. Now, now we'll, we'll know that there's there's three bikes of batteries. You have the chassis, house, and you have the generator battery. Correct. Now, basically, I can you say with everything I've done, have I zeroed out this coach? You know, have I brought this back? Oh, you sure have. Okay, we've changed chassis batteries, house batteries, new tires, everything else, so we're going through. So on the chassis batteries, I didn't look inside here. Um, you know, while the other batteries were about five years old, I would, I'm probably was a little premature on changing, but what's your thought on that? Well, on the chassis batteries, these, these tend to age a little bit sooner than the others. It's a pretty harsh, hot environment back there. So getting five years out of these batteries is, a, is about expected. Okay. Now, if we were in the house, we'd expect seven on the generator, much longer. Okay. Um, so again, you know, there's, there's not much to do here. You got a chassis uh, uh, battery charge if you want to just walk by here and see that it's actually functioning. Okay, so that's this down here. I'm saying right. a red light. A red now, because goodness. we're currently connected to shore power, the chassis batteries are charging, right? That's right. Okay, what are the situations that the chassis batteries charge? They charge any time you're supplying the coach with AC power, whether that's from a plug at a campground or you've got your generator running. Okay, but when you're, when you're driving, they're not charging. They're that's discharging. correct. So that charger's disconnected while you're driving. Okay. Now, we're hearing some noise going on back here. What's this? Yeah, so these will be in different places, but what we have here is a diesel-fired heater. Mm -hmm. So what this thing does, is, uh, especially when you're dry camping or when it's extremely cold, provides you another source of heat inside the coach generally with heat exchangers mounted at the floor. Okay. Its other function is to actually heat the hot water, the domestic hot water. Okay. You've got other ways to do that, but when you're dry camping, that's the way that you're gonna do it almost always, because you don't wanna drain your batteries unnecessarily. So okay, right now, you know the condition of the coach, we're hearing it buzzing. What's it doing actively right now? So right now, what we're hearing is a circulator pump. Mm -hmm. The way this works is it heats uh, engine coolant, doesn't matter what it is, Eats a fluid, heats a fluid that goes through the coach mm -hmm. to the hot water heater. That's why that pump is always on. 
and then depending on the demands, it'll actually circulate hot water through the heat exchangers inside. So this just has, so if I were to jump in the shower in an hour, I have hot water right now. Yeah, so you can actually increase how quickly that hot water regenerates within your hot water system by keeping this on and your 120 volt. It so you got some options. It almost like a recirculating pump that you would have in your home. Uh, somewhat similar to that. Okay, now in there, you know, in, inside the panel, there's 120 volt hot water in this 12 volt hot water. Is this the 12 volt hot water? This would be your 12 volt hot water. Okay. Okay, now I know this one thing that uh, I think you and, and Dan at uh, Marathon suggested I check occasionally. What is this over here? Yeah, so because it's diesel fired, we got diesel fuel that's coming in it, and any time we supply diesel to any combustion engine or burn chamber, we want to filter it. So that's the diesel fuel filter, and all you're looking for is some sediment or water that might uh, end up in there. It probably isn't going to happen, but that's why it's there. But, but if I do, I put a cup underneath, drain it in there, that's and then it there replenishes itself. You know, nothing to point out, and you know, if you go to the forums, you commonly hear this referred to by a brand name, Wabasto. You know, that I guess that's the big name in diesel-fired uh, units, but this is not a Wabasto. Yeah, so at the end of the day, there's a Wabasto, there's an Aqua Hot, and okay. here we have an S-Bar. Okay. And all three of those are diesel-fired burners. Mm -hmm. The difference being, the only real difference being other manufacturer's name is the Aqua Hot has one of these burners inside it and your hot water heater. When we have a, a Wabasta or, a, or an S-Bar, as we get around your coach, we'll find that the hot water heaters are separated from this unit. Aqua Hot packages it all together. As you said, there's different manufacturers. Is one considered more reliable? You said Aqua Hot is kind of an all-in-one. Then Wabasta and S-Bar, they have their components separated. Is one, in your opinion, is one method better than another? Not really. I mean. The, the only downfall to an Aqua Hot, if we want to give them a downfall, is it's, it's a very expensive product. So if you had some, you know, some, some big maintenance on it, it, it would be much more costly than obviously replacing a split system. But the beauty to the Aqua Hot, it's all self-contained, so it's easier to install and, and remove and put another one in. But, you know, at the end of the day, they all have a diesel-fired burner. They produce, as I've said, you know, a way to heat the inside of your coats and your hot water. Okay, if you got it, if you got this a little is how I can get hot water and I can get floor heat. Right. Okay. And, and there's there's even another one. You'll have hurricanes too. But at the end of the day, just that shouldn't be a buying dis decision, deterrent, or or value either way. Whether you got as long as you have a dealer who's happy to service them, you're in good shape. That's right. And, okay. How and, about maintenance on these types of devices? What is for normal users? You know, not an entertainer driver driving all over the country for a normal user. How, what is a good recommended, if it's not giving you problems, you know, time to go in and have it checked out or for service? Well, like most everything on a coach that doesn't have a predetermined time, mm -hmm. really an annual inspection when you're doing everything else. So that's the time to check the fuel filter, make sure the fuel pump is working properly, the circulator pump is working properly, and the spray nozzle hasn't gotten dirty. So to that point, there's the maintenance aspect and there's also a use aspect. Mm -hmm. So down here in sunny Florida, unless we're dry camping, we don't need this guy. Mm -hmm. So, but it's there and like your generator, it needs to be exercised. So every month, every other month, when you're out there camping, turn on your hot water ver uh, demands through this, fire it up, let it work. And see, I'm still confused. Right now we're connected to shore power. I know this is 12 volt. I think a 12 volt and then I think a battery. But Right now, if I want to take a shower and I'm on shore power, am I best off using 12 or 120 volt water heating? Well, I would use 120 because it's free. Okay. <laughs> and so you're obviously burning diesel fuel here. Okay. The one exception would be that I've got several people with me and I got to I got to do shower after shower. You know, I can't put off doing the the uh, wash. If you have a lot of demands for hot water, then you may want to turn this one and the 120 volt one on just so that you can cycle that hot water faster. Okay, now if we're dry camping and we're out, I'm using the 12 volt right. this unit because I'm using less electricity, more diesel to, right. to power it. Okay, in here, just an air cleaner, that's just a just big... Just an air cleaner. We checked that, that's good. This is my dash, dash AC mm -hmm. unit. Anything else we need to know about here? Not really. In your particular coach, this is where a cutoff switch is for your tow vehicle, but that'll vary from 
you know, converter to converter, you likely won't find that in and most this is, The way I'm going to understand it, this controls the electrical that's coming out to the rear of the coach that connects to the car to control right. the turn signals brake. Only if I have a problem in the car. I turn right. that off of it as it keeps on. Correct. Right. Okay, anything else we should know here? No, this is a pretty simple compartment. Okay, now I know to get to this compartment, we have to pull a latch here. And I, I'm still learning how to do this. Let's see. There, I got it right. We're going to move over here. Okay, this has two doors over here. And you open it up and you notice it's a Volvo engine. I'm going to be quiet, which these people are probably going to appreciate and let you talk. Well, this is what makes you go down the road, and Prevo is actually a Volvo company, so they made a transition from Detroit's uh, engines to Volvo a few years ago. Um, a much quieter, smoother engine, and uh, there's a lot of things going on back here, but you don't need to really worry about much other than making sure your fluid levels are what they should be and that your belts are tightened. You want to do a cursory inspection everywhere back here. Do I see fluids that shouldn't be there? Do I see something that just looks unusual from the last time I was here? I'd, if you're on any hard surface, I'd call down to see if I had any drips. Okay. Um, so other than checking your oil, checking okay. your coolant level that's up there in that reservoir, that's all you really need to do okay. back here. From what we went through in our orientation, both with you and with Marathon, right. okay, here's my understanding. When the engine's cool, I come in here, I check the oil, I put it, it's a very long rod, I'm not gonna do it right now, good idea to have a rag with you, clean it up, put it back in. Honestly, that thing has gotta be five feet tall, it's right. taller than me. Put it back in. You have a minimum and maximum line on that. Right. If I get down to the, if I'm at maximum right now, if I get down to minimum, that's about approximately a gallon of oil, correct? It certainly was in the Detroits, we'd have to look on Volvo, but. It's probably about the same. And the smart thing to do is don't just pour a gallon in if it's in there, put a half a gallon in, you know, use a funnel, put it in right here, and then we're pretty much good to go sure. on that. The other thing to check is, and you said it, you know, so don't get your hands dirty, put a rag in your hand. You know, I guess first, make sure, well, nobody's in here, but right. we'd hit that switch to off so that nobody accidentally turns anything off. But we're checking belt tension. And the phrase I'm using, and there's probably a better word, is like piano type, piano string type. You want your belt tight. And yeah, and so what we're doing here is that some of those belts, the tension on them is put on them by airbags. So what okay. we're really trying to find out is are those airbags inflated? And while you were looking at, well, pushing on those belts, you're also looking for cracks and the rib belts, you're looking for pieces of rib being missing. You're looking for those things that are unusual. And let's point it, these are brand new belts. You know, That's we had right. them put on at Prevo and checked. Well, again, uh, I don't know if Zero Out is an official service, but we basically brought, you know, while we did have service records on it, we just brought everything up so that, you know, we now know when all our service intervals are. Now, the other thing I was told to check is right here. This is our, our coolant reservoir. Correct. And, you know, one thing we noticed, now I noticed that it was full before, the sight lines down just a little bit. Uh, you know, we did have all this change of paper, but we noticed some of it came out. We had a little, some loose fittings there. Do you think that's what happened? Because we noticed one morning we had a, a small puddle, not a big one. Yeah, and that's why we're looking underneath, especially if yeah. it's been ex much colder than we're used to. Mm -hmm. These compression uh, hose clamps, when it gets really cold out, they tend to be just a bit, little bit looser than they had been before. Mm -hmm. And if there's ever any hose clamp related leaks, they'll show themselves on colder weather. Okay, and here at Marathon, we saw it. They topped it off. They tightened everything down. Now, this is for, uh, oh, by the way, to fill this, you fill this when it's cold and you come right. back in here. And, and honestly, if there's no leaks, that should last me quite some time. Okay, this is for my transmission fluid. Correct. Now, same thing. But however, we do this after a long day. This is, you know, by the way, we're at Marathon. You're going to hear trucks and you're going to hear uh, motorhomes going around. That this is best checked when warm or the engine's hot, but there's also another way to do it inside that you said may be more accurate. The most accurate way to check the transmission fluid mm -hmm. is by its internal sensor, and to access that sensor is through your shift pad. And that on there, and I'm sure we'll do something on that at some point, on an Allison transmission, you press both arrows simultaneously, Correct. it goes through a process. And on this one, it showed we were a little low. We're, even though we had to transcend, uh, a completely drained and in, 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 uh, in, in new fluid put in. We were showing, was it we were four quarts low? That's correct. Okay, we're gonna get that topped off here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What else do I need to know 
back here. Oh, you mentioned something about be careful of heat up here. Yeah, if you decide to come back here and look at your engine after you've stopped, this device that's up here is actually a diesel particulate filter. Names aren't important, but what is important, that can get up to 1,200 degrees. So if it's been through a regeneration cycle and you go open the doors and there's extreme heat, don't be overly alarmed. Okay. And so as you said, if you open it up, it's too hot, it's okay. It's on there, hot caution. Heed right. the warning. Now, oh, down here, I want to ask you a question. There, there's three different alternators on here, correct? Right. Okay, you have one here and you have two here. Can you tell me the difference in what they do? Yeah, and these configurations will change as well, too, depending this on is how they- converter to converter. And how they've configured it. So, in this particular case, you have two alternators that are dedicated to the house, okay, the marathon side, okay. and then you've got one that's dedicated to the chassis side of this. Okay. You will find as many as four uh, alternators on some of these coaches. Okay. Well, I can tell you, so far, so good. We've had some cool weather, some hot weather just over the past few days. So far, everything's working well. And then over here, this blue cylinder, this is? Yeah, so that's part of your uh, dash air system. So there's a, a, a dryer for the, uh, for the refrigerant system. Nothing you need to do, nothing to touch over there. If there's an air conditioning problem, get service. So pre, on a pre-ride check, this only takes a minute. You open up, you check the levels, you look at the side glass, and you move forward. That's is that all, pretty good? That's it. Okay, let's go on and move over to the, I guess, do we call this the driver's side phase? Yep, driver's okay. side's good. Okay, we'll go ahead and close this. And we'll move to the next one. Okay, now I notice this one opens a little different. You have the electronic lock on there. Yeah, the t last two bays are electronic locks. They're bays you generally don't have to get into. And from the factory, these, these bays would be used for a different purpose, so you don't have the, uh, the traditional locks. Okay, and one thing we should point out in part one of the video, we know we showed that you have a diesel fuel filler on the other side. Right. This is your, your driver's side filler. There's no DEFL here. This is Correct. just diesel only. Right. Now we get into this, and I gotta tell you from a newbie's point of view, you open this up and it's nerve-wracking. This is information overload. So, I don't know, you want to start here and work your way over? Sure, sure. Well, before we get in this, and, and it's not terribly important, but it is if you want water in your coach, it's directly below the filler. Uh, oh. There you go. It's actually where your hose reel comes out, so you can hook up to your, your city water connection. And, and that's one thing important to point out. When we get down here, this thing has three different ways to bring water into the coach. Right, most, on here. yeah, which is one more than most do. Now, I think it, I'd like to hear your comments. What we're hearing here, this is probably the easiest way to do it. There's already sediment filters on the other side. You can add one in here, but you pull this out. I'm not sure what the hose length is on here. Do you, are you sure? I think what I pulled it out was about 30 feet. Okay, so that's gonna work in just about all situations. And it's, and if you notice on the button, I don't know if you can see it, there's a toggle switch here. It's hose in or hose in. Right. So let's go hose in. And then, that's like really no muss, no fuss. The water comes right in. Okay. Yeah, and then this particular conversion, this is a dual purpose bay. But the thing that's the most different from conversion to conversion, year to year, is the electrical systems. Mm -hmm. So here is where we house our inverter chargers. So they're responsible for keeping the house batteries charged, and when you're dry camping or you're driving down the road without your generator going, they'll produce enough AC power for some portion of the AC loads. In your particular case, you can run two of your roof airs off of these units okay. and, and some other things, but. What is the easiest way to explain to somebody, such as myself, it's just not, does it? When I think of an inverter, okay, let's take it down to a small scale, something in my car, I'll plug it into a 12 volt out and all of a sudden it'll give me a plug, I can plug a 110 to. Right. Now this is a jumbo size. How does that equate to here? We know that this is connected to the the house batteries here, then how does that equate and what does it do from that point? Well, it's a, it's similar to what you've talked about, the car plug-in one, that car plug-in one can't charge your your car battery, so mm -hmm. it's dual purpose. But these, these are very sophisticated devices and they produce a, a power out that that's referred to as pure sine wave, but let's not get wrapped around there. Yeah, let's, let's not. <laughs> let's just say that the power that's coming out of there is, is almost as good as power coming out of any other 
uh, power generation system, whether it's your generator or commercial power. Okay. So this is good, clean power. Okay. Yeah. And converter to converter, we'll see some changes here too. But one of the good things that Marathon does, they're not excluded, but certainly one of the things they do is give you a way to continue to enjoy your, your uh, travels in the event that you have catastrophic failure. Okay, now tell me, that's what these knobs are, are for up here, correct? Right, because everything that gets powered through these inverters when you don't have AC power from your shore or generator sources mm -hmm. goes through here even when you have an AC source commercial or generator. Okay. So if this catastrophically fails, those things, and those are all important things that go through there. Your refrigerator's going through there. Mm -hmm. Things that are critical are here. So if one of these critically fails, you want to still continue that trip. They've, they've provided a means by which you can electrically bypass or go around this this inverter charger. Okay, so I guess it, a simple explanation. I'm inside and I can alert that that the refrigerator's down or whatever, the, the, the side of the house that's handling that. And I'm either on shore power or generator. I can go, you know, uh, get off of inverter, go to shore or start the generator. Boom, I switched to generator. Everything that was originally going through inverter is now uh, going through the and generate. Did I say that clearly enough? Yeah, so it's being powered directly. Mm -hmm. So the only the only thing that uh, you have to be concerned with is that, as you stated, you could power directly from shore or generator. Mm -hmm. But hey, when we're driving down the road, that just means that we got to keep the generator In on. Generator. So right. so if you're going on and you have, if you want to keep the house cool, you had the inverter going. You realize it's an issue. You pull over the side of the road, start your generator, and turn that on. Is Correct. That, is that? Again, I'm learning as I go along. Don't laugh at me on this. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay. So um, now I notice, you know, in, in a lot a lot of the coaches, Zantrex is the big name. This is Schneider Electric Zantrex. Is that just a company that put together this package or yeah, I don't know they in are. the whole inverter world you'll see different converters use different uh, brands, mm -hmm. whether they're from Outback Power or they're Magnum. Uh, back in the day everybody used trace units, which okay. were virtually bulletproof, but they've gone and there's not a direct replacement. Now, what I've learned in the past is sometimes the larger, the brighter color the knobs are. It usually has a correlation to the importance of what they do. And here we have inverter disconnects. They're large, they're red. In which situations would I use these two red knobs? So in the same situation we spoke of earlier, we mm -hmm. have catastrophic failure of one of these units. Okay. There's no reason to bring DC power into it. So mm -hmm. in fact, they could be causing problems. So we will uh, disconnect the battery from the failed inverter charger. And that's what those two knobs are for. Now we, sh we see one inverter charger here. It's important for everybody to realize there's two. Okay. I'm not sure we get it I, in I here, but it's, this there's thing another might be one in the here. way, but there's two of them here. So Correct. I guess here's the units here. I don't know what this big box is here. Is that just the brain? That's spot? all part of it. Okay, so it's all part of it, you know, come together. Mm -hmm. As you've learned over the last few days, I've been trying to understand how to use this in, in, in an, a practical application. For example, I'm going to take a trip. When I get back, suppose I put it into a storage facility for, and I'm not going to use it for a month or so. It's going to be plugged into 50 amp shore power. Do I turn these off? I mean, I know I'm going to keep my batteries charged. I know I'm going to keep an AC on to keep the humidity out. I do live in Florida. What's the recommended operation for that? Yeah, so this is when checklists become really important because it's not something you're going to do day in and day out. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's there's many correct answers to that question, but uh, it, so we we've got 50 amps of uh, 50 amps of power available to us. We want to make sure we maintain the humidity level, so we're going to have an air conditioner running. But we are indoors, so one air conditioner is enough. So there's really no reason to run both of these. Mm -hmm. So the important thing is that we keep the air conditioner on and we maintain the, the batteries. If you want the refrigerator, we'll do that too. So you can figure out which one of these two is supporting those critical loads. You could physically turn the other one off. Mm -hmm. What we want to do when we're in storage is turn as many things off as possible. Mm -hmm. We just we don't want to. Uh, we know we're probably going to keep the refrigerator on. Yeah. It's not going to keep food in. You turn out. Right. I guess it's not that important, you know. Otherwise, uh, and you know, again, in Florida or wherever you can live, if you're in a humid environment or anywhere, you want to keep the air turning, oh, sure. whether it's air conditioner or yeah. fan. So, so you're indoor storage, you want to make sure that your generator is not going to start. So that means in the event that you do lose your power, mm -hmm. 
your batteries are going to drain down until they're dead because mm -hmm. there was no generator to start. So we want to, if we can, not all, all models do it, but these do, is we want to go in and configure these that they cannot go into the inverter mode. Okay. So in the event the power goes away, then everything shuts off. Okay. And that's really the safe way to do it. You want to protect that, you know, your batteries are several thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. that's much more than, you know, the beer that goes bad in the fridge or whatever you happen to have. Mm -hmm. That's about as much as I can absorb. I guess that's an inverter joke. Absorb or float. That's as much as I can do right now. Now next, we have these stainless steel devices. Yeah, so in our, our earlier discussion, we talked about the diesel-fired heat. Mm -hmm. This is traditional, almost traditional, electric hot water heaters. There's two of them. Mm -hmm. And the only re reason they're not just like the ones in your home is they also have a connection in the back to support a hot water loop, a heat exchanger that's heat based. Okay. So those, these will run off 120 volts just like your home unit now, does. Why do we have two of them? Well, there's, there's a couple reasons to do that and converters do this differently as well, is that this gives us double the amount of heating elements. Mm -hmm. So depending oh, okay. on how they're wired, it could, it could uh, recycle faster. Um, uh, that, that's really the, the main reason to do it. Otherwise, you could just put a single 20, uh, 20 gallon so, unit in so, here. So both of them are, are being heated simultaneously. Right. But this way, if you're using a lot of, a lot of water, they, it will automatically switch, or, or how does that no, work? No, they're, they're both putting out water at the same time. Okay. So, oh, okay. Yeah, but you know, if you bought a 20 uh, gallon unit, it would have the same wattage heating element as one of these. Okay. Um, now, and, and in, we, in terms of maintenance and things that I need to do, whether it's on a check or uh, just a regular schedule, what do I need to check in this bay? Generally, you don't have to do a thing in here. Okay. We have remote panels inside if there's any inverter alarm, so we don't have to worry about that. You know, some people will recommend that periodically you go to your hot water heaters and at the drain valve, mm. you know, watch the water come out. You don't see any sediments, you're fine. Okay. Um, but now, other than that, you, that's you it. You have some drains down here. Do I never need to, ever need to do anything with those? Or? Well, like I said, if you want to drain and just see if there's any sediment in those, you can. Okay, and periodically. that would be, I don't know if you can see it on camera, we have this one down here. It's the two small hoses. Oh, excuse me. Oh, down here. I forgot mm -hmm. that we can just... All right. Okay. There, and the other one is... Right there. Right here. Mm-hmm. I gotta tell you, newbies will appreciate this. There's a lot to learn. Take your time and, you know, don't do it in a rush. Uh, and get out there and use it. Go little bits, bits and pieces. So far, that's working for me. Okay, so that's all we pretty much need to know about that. That's right. Okay, let's go on and move over to the next one. All right. Oh, by the way, did we ever figure out why this is an electronic lock and the others have latch lock? Because uh, the factory doesn't do that when they latch. <laughs> oh, okay, so that's the reason why. Okay, we're going to move and, over. And why they swing this way rather than lift is because we got slides. We have slides right. here. And notice this is a two slide coach. It really is roomy inside. Okay. And over here, this has got to be plumbing. It is plumbing, and it's a very attractive looking bay, right? It really is. It's yeah. a nice, clean bay. Yes. And, and what you see here on the top, section with all the red or blue valves okay. is your common manifolds. So that's feeding everything inside the coach that's either hot, red, or blue, cold. And basically if I have a leak and I know where it's coming from, I turn it off. That's correct. If I have a leak and I don't know where it's coming from, turn it all off and start turning back on just a little bit of sure. time. Is that mm -hmm. a, a common way to do that? It is. We also look in here behind these are your tanks. Configurations vary from converter to converter, but behind this, here. This is it's fresh black and gray? That's right. Okay. So we got fresh black and gray, or sometimes it's fresh and black and gray combined. Okay, but here we have three separate types. That's correct. Okay. Yep. But just looking at what you see here besides the faucet is control valves or control switches. Okay. That's these over here. Right. And one of the things that you'll see on a marathon and only on a marathon is when you hook up your shore power or your sewer hose, Marathon has a drop-down door that opens be below this. I do. Let's give a demo of that. Sure. Okay, now down here, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but there's a drop-down door here. And basically, and I learned this from watching a video on, on the Marathon Coach website. They have some good YouTube videos up there. That basically, when you're going through, you just do this in sequence. You know, you have a door down here. We already have it connected to power. That door is down. You have a power extend or retract and that works both for your 50 amp hose reel and that's a pretty long hose there 
and you have a short cord that you can press in or or out. Like right here, you can barely see it. We'll just put, oh, we gotta turn it on first. And then that will extend it in or out. You even have a remote control that you can use. So when you're pulling it out, you can uh, have it go in or out without it dragging the floor. You do the same thing with the sewer hose, which is cool. It kind of packs it with air and shoots it out or brings it back in. Now let's get into the autofill and how that works, because that's this area down here. Yeah, so you got to, there has to be a way to put water in your freshwater tank for storage. Okay. You're, you're taking off and you need some water because we all need some water. We're going to stop at a rest stop or whatever we're going to use some. So nobody travels empty. If we're a campground, a campground person, we're probably at a quarter of a tank, but dry camp, we fill when we can. So how do we get water into this tank? Well, we've hooked now, Remember, we had that hose we showed a few minutes ago, that's right. the, the reel that's built in. Yeah, and in this particular case, we could do it off that reel or we could do it off one of these fittings. Two ways to put pressurized city water into it. And then, so, well, how do we get it into the tank? Okay. So this autofill valve, if we engage that, it will take the water that's coming in from the city okay. and we'll start filling the, the uh, freshwater storage tank. Well, we all know once we turn that on, we're not going to sit around and wait for it to fill. We're going to go do our whatever. And at, at the end of the day, we're going to fix, forgot, forget that we had that left on. Mm -hmm. So once it gets full, there's a sensor in there that automatically turns off the auto fill function. So that's one way to fill it. And the other way to fill it is right over there on the right hand side at the top is a simple gravity fill. If you were to unscrew that cap, that uh, gives you direct access into the freshwater tank. Well, you, I'm trying to unscrew it. I'm sure there's well, a it's, it's probably on there pretty tight because okay. it's, it's probably yes, seldom we haven't ever opened used. This yet, but this right. is a gravity fill in right. here. Yep. Okay. So that's one way to put the other way to put fresh water in there. And that gravity fill is also the place where you put your sanitizer if you're going to sanitize your tank because you hadn't used it in some period of time or you were skeptical of the water that you got from a campground that had you know, bad well water. Or you know, something. and I'm curious about that. I hope reader viewers will make some comments. We've been having conversations here that how often do you sanitize your tank? Is it based on non uses or usage? A lot of different opinions. Post whatever you're seeing this video, post your opinions. Let's hear what you do here. Now, so basically, and I guess the big benefit of autofill, just to break it down and simple, I know my vintage bus, I have a tank, it's translucent. I hook up, you know, a hose from the campground. I turn it on, I have a water restrictor, it goes in. I have to look at it visually. When it gets about 80% just on a visual, I turn it off. Right. On this, when I come to a campground, I do the same thing. Of course, I can't see my tanks, except through the Crestron app. On their tech link, I can see it. That I come in and I am going to use this, the, the marathon. This is that 18 inch hose that they talk about. You connect this on the quick connect. You connect this to your clean water hose. You just turn on your water. You right. know, do you need to have a water restrictor on before the, it comes in? Well, certainly in the coach, they restrict the pressure so they don't hurt anything inside the coach. Mm -hmm. but especially down here in Florida, when we've got nice hot summer days, that hose that is extended in, in the campground, if you put too much sun on, a, on that hose that's got too much pressure, that hose will burst. Okay, so we put a, a, we put a water restrictor on the, to say, the pit spigot or the, the faucet side. And right. we come in, just turn on autofill, turn it on, let her rip, Go read a book. You don't have to monitor. You go inside, look at the tech link, and, and, and view it. And then when it gets down to a certain percentage and it auto fills up, is that how that works? It will if you're using that and connected. But when you're using that, you, you also are using the city water for things inside. So once it's full, it's done. And if you wanted to use your 12-volt system, your dry camping way of using the pumps, you could. But frankly, there's no reason to when you're on city water. Okay. And that'll vary for for a converter to converter Now, when well. you're on city water, do you are you always using water out of the tank, or is it ever coming straight through? Straight like if, in. Okay, so if your water pump is not on, right? Okay, is it using the pressure from the hose to drive water into the coach? That's right. Uh, on this coach. Okay. That's not every coach. Okay. So some coaches. So if the autofill's not on, then it's using the pressure. If the autofill's on, it it's filling up, then it's cutting it off and not allowing more water in, and then using the water pump to take it from the tanks. I hope I'm getting too complicated from the tanks into, let's say, your shower. 
is that in your coach when you're connected to city water you're using city water in your coach okay i know i'm using their pressure or i'm using the water pump pressure to get it to the shower the faucet you're using everything about city water you're using their pressure their water and the only reason you're doing the autofill is because you need water in the tank for your next stop down the road okay so what autofill is is basically way you just don't have to watch it while it's filling up and it will automatically stop when you're full mm -hmm. And what we said about using city water is not applicable to every coach mm -hmm. because there are some toilets that require some high pressure. And in those particular conversions, you will always use the water in the tank. Okay, and we went through here where you could turn off the different manifolds. Of course, over here, this is your sanitary station. You have paper towels, you have soap, and you have, and this is a very nice quality faucet here for, for washing up and, of course, a place to put your gloves. Did we miss anything here? No. It's a pretty detailed walkthrough, I think. Okay. All right. We're almost finished up here. Let's go take a look at the next one. Okay, we have one more bay up here. Well, really, the other one's storage, and we've seen the other side. It, I guess you don't want to call this the brains of the coach. This is the brawn of the coach. Is, is that a good way to put this? That's right, because this exceeds the capability of the shore power connection you're connected to. So if you need to power everything on a hot summer day and a 50 amp shore connection is not enough, you've got 80 amps of 240 volts right there out of that generator. Okay, 80 amps. And so, and if we didn't say this is a generator, it's a Kohler generator in this. Now let's talk about maintenance on this. Now. What do I need to do? This thing was just serviced. When is my next service interval on this? On Kohler, every 150 hours, they want you to change the oil. But like your engine, periodically, you should be checking your oil, your antifreeze uh, level, and look for leaks. Okay, basically what we're looking for as I'm doing my pre-drive pre check, I'm coming around. Okay, we have this cardboard down here. This is going to make it very easy to see if there's leaks. Because that, that will show us uh, right, right down here. The coolant, you're saying, I believe that Dan was telling me, you always want to keep this low. I mean, low is good because it's going to expand up and you don't want to have too much fluid in there because it, it could, could leak out. That's right. So the low level is the, is the correct level when the engine's cold. Okay. And down here, you got to tell people who might not know what these are. Yeah, so these engines are suspended on airbags, and the reason you do that is to make sure you don't uh, transfer the movement of the generator, the vibration to inside the coach. There's two things important. One of them is not to transfer that vibration, but the other is to make sure you don't hear the generator. So you can see here is all the acoustic panels that have been put onto this entire bay area to make sure that you don't hear the generator. Well, you can hear it, but I tell you, you gotta, if your TV's on, you're probably not gonna hear it. You know what's funny, it's we, you and I were looking at other coaches that you know, we were talking in part one is where you're going through and give me evaluations. So there's, there's one who's, you know, a, a coach that I, we wanted to go see, but we found this one and it didn't do that trip. In the hush box in there, it was more had blankets in there. This looks like more of an insulated compartment. How would you compare those two? Yeah, so you'll find the, the blankets rarely. You'll find this covering over the acoustic material, and sometimes the acoustic material will just be exposed. Mm -hmm. In old, old days, it looked like egg crate foam, and it didn't last that long. Newer ones have uh, a, a foil that's over the outside of them, so they'll, they'll hold up a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But and, it's, and, Oh, and I'm sorry. And then over here, that's an air compressor. And what does that power? Yeah, so on these conversions, when you're parked, there's a lot of things that require air to operate. So if you have air doors, if you've got a coach that has an auto leveling system, there has to be a source of air to support those air needs. So when I hit the button for the door, and for example, the bathroom has a double door, it opens or closes silently. It takes about two seconds for it to kick in. That is probably this, which is a tank up front. That that's right. Going. So that's that's where the where Marathon always puts theirs, or historically, is they stick it in the engine bay to acoustically uh, deaden the sound on the uh, air Now, is there anything on a, on a pre-drive check that just by glance it's something I should do? I hear it says drain monthly, and somewhere there is a drain here. I don't see it. Uh, so that, that drain that they're referring to, as we looked at the hydronic heat, the diesel-fired mm -hmm. heater back there, there was a fuel filter that we looked for water and debris. Mm -hmm. That's what they're referring to. In fact, it's a very similar filter that you'll see right uh, midway. Back. Back in here somewhere. Uh, down. Oh, right down here. There you okay, go. Okay, there it there is. There you go. Okay, and that we're looking for, if it's sturdy or whatever, we would put a cup or something underneath, just let Correct. it uh, clean back mm -hmm. up. But again, 150 hours. 
Uh, and what's good, just like most places, they documented, you know, they did a label on here when it was last done. Right. And again, this is, you know, when in doubt of what you can run, use the generator. You can run pretty much everything. Four ACs, heat TVs, appliances, washer, dryer, refrigerator, uh, dishwasher. All no problem, right? Right. Okay, now on the barbecue grill, if we throw that in the mix, is that too much? Typically not. Okay. And if, if, if so, this thing's smart enough, it'll uh, shed some load and then we'll, yeah. without having any problems. Okay, anything else we need to know back in here? Yeah, don't be afraid to run these things. You know, oftentimes we'll find coaches that are 10 years old that have less than 100 hours on them. Everything needs to be exercised. And, and one thing we're to point out, like, let's say, if I'm driving on the road with a friend and we're on the road for hours, we can keep, if it's, again, not a hot, hot day, just keep the dash here, which is operate off the engine going. But if we want to keep the cabin cool, or if it is a hot day, or if you have people back there, run your generator. Is that, is that the best way to do it, or are you running them off inverters? Well, again, you know, it depends on whether or not you need to exercise this. If you need to exercise it, run it. But otherwise, off the inverters being charged by the engine, you can run two of your roof airs. Okay, and it's paired uh, a pre-selected two or another two. Right. Okay, is that pretty much here for that? It is. Okay, I know. And, and, and the one thing when we get around this slide, you're going to say, watch your head. Watch your head you, is right. You know, and this, this one is a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. I think we pretty much covered it. You know, the next bay up there is one we've already seen from the other side. It's a storage bay. Now, granted, you know, I, I'm not claiming to be an expert on this. I can tell you, Gil knows this stuff. And again, I want to thank you so much for your time. You, know, you came here and did the pre-inspection. Um, you know, for me before I got here when Marathon was doing the PDI. You know, that's a multi-day process. Then when I arrived, we went through, you pointed things out, did the closing on it. Now, you've been going out and helping me learn section by section. Uh, I don't know if you put it in this video. If people want to contact you, and again, you know, there, there's a fee. I'm not going to discuss that. Uh, I'm fortunate you live close to Marathon, which made it convenient for you. What's the best way for them to contact you? Well, I'm certainly on the Prevo Owners Group forum all the time. Otherwise, just send me an email. Okay, what, what's the email address you'd like them to use? Uh, as, a, as a former boater, I still use trawlergill with one L at gmail.com. Okay, we're putting that address right down there. Again, Gil, I don't, this is, if you're shopping for a Prevo, it, it can be overwhelming. There's a lot of information overload. There's a lot of long days as you're doing the transition to it, even if you own another brain bus. Having somebody go on your side is just a good thing. Gil, I want to thank you so much for your time. People say that we look like brothers. I guess it's that bald head. You Congratulations know? again on your new coach. Again, that uh, thank you for uh, for helping me make it make sure. this make this possible. Remember, if you want to keep up with my videos, the easiest thing to do just go to Facebook.com and like us. Don't forget to subscribe to the videos. Oh, we even have a, a, a Twitter account. I don't know that much about our Twitter, but here's how you find us here. That's it for now. I'm the Gadget Guru, Andy Parr.